But I was always intrigued by bioglasses, the fact that you could make calcium and phosphate and have silica, which is a glass former, which is the most ubiquitous glass former, but then trying to uh, have calcium and phosphate, which are the mineralized matrix of your bone. And having them part of this glass was something that was very fascinating to me. And I was very much interested in looking at how these glasses could be used as an implant material uh, to form bone. And uh, this was way in the early 90s when I started my career as a young assistant professor trying to look for various ways of trying to get funding. Uh, and it did not go anywhere because of the fact that, you know, uh, bioglasses have already been in existence and they wanted to know what was new that I could do. And uh, it only, things started really taking a different turn when in the mid-1990s, there was a nice review article that came out from Bob Langer and his group in MIT talking about degradable materials. Up until then, the concept of degradable materials was just something that was known to polymers and environmentally friendly stuff, uh, but nothing related to something that could have an impact in the human life. And when this article came out, it really clicked a light in my, you know, in my mind. I said, well, what if ceramic materials could be made biodegradable? And uh, we could attribute the same kind of features that polymers do. And in a sense, that's how the sol gel process came into vogue, because you had the ability of making ceramic materials behave like polymers by view of the chemical reaction. So I thought, how about if we can develop uh, 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 ceramic materials or bioceramics uh, and have them resolve and show characteristics like polymeric biodegradable materials. And another thing that really fascinated me was the fact that calcium phosphate is a mineralized matrix of natural bone. So it's got to be safe, more safer than any biodegradable synthetic polymer because you always have to worry about what happens to the carboxylic acids or the esters when they get into the body and when they, even though they claim that they degrade, one never knows what happens to its end point when it finally leaves the body. Whereas when you have calcium phosphates, they are part of your natural bone and as a result, it is completely safe. So we started exploring the fact that what if you make, and this coincided with the, with the tremendous development in nanotechnology. And the idea was what if we made nanoparticles of calcium phosphate. These nanoparticles, just by the virtue of the fact that they are nanomaterials, exhibit very high reactivity and they dissolve. Whereas up until then, most of the effort in bioceramics was focused on making bulk, dense calcium phosphates, which does not sinter, uh, which, which sinters, but it does not degrade. So the notion was that ceramics are no good, they are brittle, they don't degrade, so metals are always better, you know, which is the age-old always comparison between metals and ceramics. But then came this idea of if you make nanoparticles of ceramics, then they exhibit this characteristic of being able to resolve. And what was even more fascinating was that these nanoparticles of calcium phosphate, because they have the charge, positive and negative charge, the phosphate is negatively charged, the calcium is positively charged, it gave us this tremendous opportunity of being able to deliver biological molecules. I, I got in touch with a, a close friend of mine who's a dentist in the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine. And he showed me that, well, these nanoparticles of calcium phosphate that you make, uh, they can actually bind and condense DNA. And I said, wow, you know, what is DNA? At that point, I had no clue what DNA is. I mean, you know, I just heard of DNA, but I had no, you know. And he said, well, that's the genetic information of your entire, you know, uh, entire being. I mean, uh, and you can actually use these to deliver genetic information to the cells and you can actually transform the cells to cure a lot of diseases. And I said, wow, really? And he said, yes, I mean, you know, and uh, have you looked at this aspect? And I said, no, let's, let's look at it. So we started together working in this area which evolved significantly over the last five to six years. We got funding from the National Science Foundation, we got funding from the National Institutes of Health, and we have shown very nicely that how you can take nanoparticles which are in the range of 20 to 30 nanometers and these calcium phosphate particles bind DNA 
and they also bind. Now DNA is a helical molecule. It's a long helical molecule, like a like a spring, like a spiral. But the beauty of the calcium phosphate is that when it comes in contact with the DNA, it actually condenses this spring. So this long helical spring is actually packed into one small condensed complex. And this complex cluster, which is all around the nanoparticles of calcium phosphate, becomes now a cluster that, that's of the size that the cells can easily uptake. So it turns out that the cells, no matter what different types of cells, primary cells, secondary cells, these cells have receptors that can attach to the calcium phosphate DNA complex and they actually ingest it. And when they ingest these particles, they go into a bag inside the cell and in the bag the calcium phosphate dissolves and the DNA is released. It goes into the nucleus and then it expresses the protein. What we have been doing in the last uh, several years is that we have worked this technology uh, in two different ways. One is uh, to basically regenerate bone. So when people have traumatic injuries where they lose bone, now bone, you know, when you have fractures, it heals. But those are simple fractures. But when you have a fracture that is much larger than a critical size, then the body is no longer able to heal it. So you need to have some kind of an external fixation that can help bone to form. So that's where we have been able to incorporate these nanoparticles into a 3D structure. And that 3D structure can be a polymer, it can be a calcium phosphate a material itself which we call as a cement, or it can be a gel. We incorporate these nanoparticles and we put it into the defect site. And lo and behold, within eight weeks, the nanoparticles are gone, the material is degraded and we form new bone. So this has been a really fascinating journey and uh, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to work with the clinician in the dental school and in the medical school, uh, combined with the McGowan Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which is a very prestigious tissue engineering center at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so we have teamed up uh, in making and regenerating bone. We can put it into natural polymers, like the clotting protein. When you get a, when you get a wound, you form a clot. That clot is fibrin. So we have taken fibrin gels and we have incorporated these nanoparticles and they can go into the body and then help regenerate bone. We've also taken these nanoparticles and entrapped them into cements. So a normal cement that we use, you know, uh, ceramic cements. But here, those cements are made out of calcium phosphate. So we have a cement reaction, we have these nanoparticles and we can inject them into form of a paste and the paste can then be shaped into the site you want to put in and the cement degrades, the nanoparticles are released, it expresses the protein and we form bone to form. Another way that we have found really fascinating over the last, you know, uh, I would just say few months basically is, is the ability of embryonic stem cells. You know, we have embryonic stem cells which can basically differentiate to pancreatic cells so that they can help solve the diabetes problem. And the ceramic materials can work as a way to help these stem cells you know, attach. And the, just from the mechanical and the chemical cues that the ceramic material, especially the ceramic calcium phosphate gels that contain these nanoparticles, can serve this dual purpose of helping the embryonic stem cell differentiate as well as delivering the factors that are needed to help form uh, and deliver insulin. So this is where we are working in the, you know, as I speak, you know, this, this is the work that is going on. And we find that's another direction where ceramic materials can be, can really play a fascinating role uh, in, uh, you know, in improving the quality of life. Uh, and that's where I've been engaged in.